Good morning. Welcome to our online Bible study for Sunday, March 27th at 9.15. And I hope that you'll grab a Bible or a Kindle reader or a Bible app for your smartphone or tablet and follow along with us as we look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And we're talking about being free because of God. And today's lesson is a reminder to the Israelites and also us about the importance of freedom and the importance of remembering the freedoms that God provides for us. And don't forget, after Bible study here in person at 1010 a.m., we will have live worship. We will have also have online worship, Facebook and YouTube. I hope that you'll join us and invite a friend. If you like the lesson today and if you like the worship service, to click and share on Facebook or YouTube with someone. Well, to introduce today's lesson, we are looking at Deuteronomy. And the word Deuteronomy literally means second law. It was not actually a second law, but it is a a repetition, a restating of the law that God had already given to the Israelite people that he handed down from Moses on Mount Sinai that they had received after they had, had escaped slavery from Egypt. But because of the Israelites' disobedience, and their rebellion, God commanded that everyone 20 years and older, except for Joshua, Caleb, and Moses, would not survive 40 years of wandering in the desert and the wilderness. And therefore, they would not be allowed to enter into the promised land. So Moses is now repeating God's commands, God's law, to this new generation of Israelites who had survived this 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And except for Moses and Caleb and Joshua, all of the first generation of those who had escaped slavery from Egypt are now gone. And so Moses is just reminding the Israelites of all the ways that they have come from the desert, their experiences that they had in the wilderness, and he tells them, during this time, God has protected you in so many ways, and because of God's protection, they had prospered. And Moses reminds reminds them of three things, to follow the Lord, to obey the Ten Commandments, and to know and recite the Shema. And the Shema is the Jewish confession of faith made up of three Old Testament Bible verses. And he also reminded Israel that God had chosen them, but now God had chosen them not because of anything they did or because of any greatness on their part, and because God had chosen them now they were to continually choose God over the other gods of the, na- of the neighboring nations. So we begin in verse 1. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. And so having established the reason why he's given them the law, Moses then calls the people to observe all the commands of the law. And he says, if they do so, the Lord God will prosper them. They will live and multiply. Words that remind them of the words that God originally gave to Abraham when he handed down this original promise. See, he had promised Abraham to make him into a great nation with descendants as numerous as the stars or the grains of sand. And so Moses continues to emphasize God's promises that they will not only multiply, but they also will go in and possess the land that God is giving to them, that God had originally given to Abraham. Verse 2. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, 
whether or not you would keep his commands. And so Moses reminds the people of God's actions during their wanderings in the wilderness. And God's purpose in those 40 years in the wilderness was, number one, to humble them, number two, to test them, and number three, to know whether or not they would keep his commands. God could have made the Israelites' wilderness wandering a whole lot easier, but he chose to make it difficult for them. Why? Well, people cannot truly be tested if, they're, if they just go through something easy. You know, if, if the teacher in school gives you a test and says, oh, do the one multiplication table or the two multiplication table. Hey, piece of cake, easy done, no problem. But if he says, do the algebraic expression of A times B equals C, figuring out A is 16 times 32, it's a little tougher. But when that happens, it shows the teacher that you know what you've been taught with math. And in the same way, this is God's purpose. He wants to know that the Israelite people have mastered his laws, that they understand his words that are written in the Old Testament. And it tells God what the people will choose when they face a difficult situation. Will they follow God? Even if it means seeming destruction or uncertainty, or will we trust that he knows what is best and that he will protect us and that he will guide us or the Israelites to the promised land and that he will guide us in uncertain situations. Verse 3, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. In part of his plan to humble Israel, God allowed them to get hungry in the wilderness. It wasn't so that the Israelites would starve, or it wasn't, and it wasn't to make their lives miserable. He had a plan to work a miracle. And the miracle was he gave them manna from heaven to feed them. And then Moses emphasizes that the Israelites did not even know what manna was when they first saw it. But it was something that God made for them. And every day for 40 years, God had been providing bread or manna for the Israelites. And the literal name of manna is, what is this? Or what is this stuff? And looking back at verse 2, it's a reminder that God did this so that they would know to trust and obey the God. And God didn't just give them bread. You know, they knew about bread. They knew how all of that worked. But God gave them manna, specifically something from heaven that they couldn't manufacture, that they couldn't do themselves, so that they would pay attention to him and his word especially on God's instructions on how they were to collect it and how they were to use it. See, God gave it to them to make them know that they could trust him to provide for their every need. And in the same way, we can trust God for all of our needs. Every human being needs more than bread or food to survive. For us to fully live and for the Israelites to fully live, we need God's instruction and that he always provides for us with miraculous events, whether it's through the prophets, whether it's through his son Jesus, or whether it's the faithfully preserved word of God. Many Christians are familiar with this verse. You've heard it in the New Testament. This is the verse that Jesus quotes when Satan tempts him. He says, man shall not live by bread alone. And so during this test of Satan, he suggested that Jesus turn stones into bread. But Jesus responds with not just this verse, 
but with the entire passage in mind. He knows what it's like to be in the wilderness. He, lo he knows what it's like to be hungry in the wilderness. He knows what it's like to be in uncertain times. And he knows that they only need to wait for God and to humbly trust him because, as the Bible says, man does not live on bread alone. We must read and reread God's word so that it becomes a part of us. We must know the words, the context. We must know the stories of the Bible. We must know the names of the people in the Bible. Those who know the Bible don't possess some special memorization skills. They do it by being in the Word of God daily. And so when temptation comes, they are ready, and we would be ready, armed with the sword, the Word of God, and faith. Verse 4, your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. So Moses reminds them of more of the miracles that they experienced during their wilderness wanderings. Their clothes did not wear out. Can you imagine that? For 40 years, the Israelites wandered in the wilderness and their clothes didn't wear out. Nowadays, you buy a new shirt and hopefully you get a year's use out of it or two years use out of it. But it wears out pretty quick. But God performed a miracle with their clothes, with the Israelites in the wilderness. And they were walking on rough, hilly, rocky ground every day, and their feet didn't swell. Amazing miracles that God provided. And so this miracle shows that God provides for his children. And Moses is talking about the physical details, the everyday details of life that will help them survive with God. Because God not only cares about our eternal souls, but he also cares about our life here and now. He provides our daily bread, but he also provides spiritual insight to help us to grow to be more like him, as well as giving us the physical bread that we need every day. Verses 5 and 6. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. The reason God did all of this is for his people. He did exactly what a father does for his children. He provides food and clothes and health. Even when the children have no idea how and where the parents will provide. And Moses explains that a disciplining God has forced on them the wilderness experience to ensure that they would keep his commandments. And so when God disciplines, it means he teaches and he corrects. And often in Deuteronomy, Moses states that the basic, idea, the basic idea of Deuteronomy with three words. We call this in our, in our English the rule of three. And this technique is used primarily to aid the memory. And so God's discipline had three purposes for the Israelites and for us. Number one, they were to keep the commandments. Number two, they were to walk in his ways. And number three, they were to fear him. All of these have the same basic idea. Know God, obey God. And the way to walk in God's way is for us to keep the commandments. By doing that, we show our fear of him. And throughout the Old Testament, there's many verses that talk about having the fear of the Lord. Now, the kind of fear that the Lord expects from his people, his followers, is a reverence. It's a respect for his power and glory. See, God can change our lives in a heartbeat. And we only survive because of God's mercy. And we know that he can and will dispense vengeance and judgment. But in his mercy, though, God has chosen not to destroy us for our sins, but he wants to grow us through some measure of discipline that works to draw us closer to him 
and to keep in his commandment. Verses 7 through 9. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks, streams, and deep springs gushing out into the hills and valleys, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil, and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce, and you will lack nothing, a land where rocks are iron, and you can dig copper out of the hills. And so Moses shows that the promised land is a land of plenty. You know, I think we have the same privilege here in the United States. There's so many things in this country that, that provide for us, that give us everything that we need or could want. And so that's what God is saying. The promised land is going to be everything that you need, everything that you can want. It'll grow the basic food staples like wheat and barley, but there'll be also other good things that will add to prosperity, grapes and figs and pomegranates, and it will flow with olive oil to help support their usual diet, but also it will give honey as a special treat. And so having assured them that God is going to meet their basic needs, Moses moves on to other kinds of resources that the promised land holds for them. It has valuable minerals. The land will provide for them strong, durable metals like iron and brass. Verses 10 and 11. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, his decrees that I am giving you this day. And so Moses encourages the Israelites that they should remember to bless God for all the good things that they will enjoy in the promised land and not forget him. God is the provider, we are the receivers. And you know, it's easy for us to forget that or take for granted what God gives us. Sometimes we even complain about the good things that God has gives us, just like the Israelites did when God provided the manna for them in the wilderness. You know, after years and years of manna being there for them every morning, they got used to it. And so, too, sometimes we get used to the miracles of God. The job that you received, the family that you have, the baby that survived the difficult pregnancy, the addiction that you conquered, all kinds of things that God gives us. We need to remember that God did all those things, but many times we forget to keep thanking him for all the things that he did. So what is the importance of God's ways for us? Before the Hebrews entered the, la the land that the Lord God had promised them after wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, God reminded them to never to forget, never to disregard the commands that he had taught them. And so in the same way, we must always keep in mind the ways of God and to humbly trust in him and follow his ways, both in faith and practice, obeying his word. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for all the ways that you bless us daily. Help us to remember you in challenging times and in times of good. Give us opportunities to tell stories of your faithfulness to everyone we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hope to see you back here in person in Paris or online, Facebook and YouTube. And